Great, well, thanks for indulging us in the second poll. Just gonna share the results. So we have quite a few folks that have never heard of it. So you're in the right place today. Some that have heard of it, but know little about it. Um, and then some that have spent quite a bit of time uh, on the website. And a few have keeners have done a deep dive. Thanks for sharing your uh, information on Teach Food First. So I'm gonna pass it over now to my colleague, Amelia, to get us started on the presentation. Over to you, Amelia. Thanks, Natalie. So I'd like to start um, by acknowledging um, with gratitude that I have the privilege to live, work, and play on the traditional and unceded territories of the Shibshan First Nation, also known as Terra BC. So the plan for today is to walk you through the new Teach for Food First toolkit. I'll also be reviewing the revised physical and health education elaborations within the BC curriculum and sharing how they link to the, to the Teach Food First lessons. We'll talk about evaluation and feedback for the toolkit. And as Natalie mentioned, we'll have time for questions at the end. So next slide. We're very excited to see so much interest from educators to teach about food and nutrition, and so grateful for all the amazing work uh, you've already been doing around food literacy in schools. In 2019, when the current food guide was released, there was a desire for creating a toolkit to support educators in the primary grades for exploring Canada's food guide in the classroom. So the resources and lessons that were specifically developed for this toolkit connect to Canada's food guide and the British Columbia curriculum, are grade specific and suitable for students learning stages, as well as consider equity and, a cultural, and cultural inclusivity. Next slide. So the toolkit was developed by the province of British Columbia and the BC Centre for Disease Control in collaboration with dietitians from regional health authorities and the First Nations Health Authority. The resources and lessons were pilot tested by BC teachers across BC. And we also want to extend a special thank you to the Indigenous Knowledge Keepers from Vancouver Island for the development of the traditional food lesson plans. Next slide. So we're going to share a short video that introduces the toolkit and its foundational approach. What influences what you eat? Taste, convenience, cost, family dynamic, tradition, culture, celebration, mood, and sometimes nutrition? For years, it's been common practice to teach children about nutrition. Concepts such as how food choices impact health, the role nutrients have in the body, which foods are healthy or unhealthy, But is this effective? Does it make children eat healthier now or later in life? The answer is probably not. Current best practice for teaching young children about food and nutrition is more about food and less about nutrition. It considers all the other factors that influence food choices and the role food plays in their life. The goal of teaching food and nutrition is to foster a positive relationship with food over time, which research shows leads to healthier eating behaviors. So what does this mean? A positive relationship with food is about being able to listen to our bodies and to eat what we need. It's about feeling joy when we eat not guilt or any other negative emotions. This toolkit supports you to teach food and nutrition in a positive and inclusive way that is sensitive to diverse family contexts. In this toolkit, you will find guiding principles for teaching food and nutrition, grade-specific lesson plans, and answers to common questions teachers and students have about Canada's food guide. While nutrition is complicated, teaching about food in the classroom shouldn't be. 
There are so many ways to explore food with your students across the curriculum. For example, where food comes from, how it's grown and prepared, eating with others, traditional foods and culture, community and celebrations, exploring the sensory aspects of food, color, shape, texture, smell, and taste. This toolkit was developed by dietitians in consultation with teachers across BC and Indigenous knowledge keepers. Inspired to learn more? Check out the toolkit at teachfoodfirst.ca Great, so as you saw from this video, um, the toolkit encourages educators to put the health and nutrition agenda aside in order to allow more space for exploration and curiosity around food in the classroom. From research, we know that providing students with positive experiences that build their comfort and skills with food outside of the health conversation is a better starting point for learning at this age, as well as for shaping positive eating habits and attitudes in the long run. So next slide. So I'd like to take a moment for a, a quick reflection activity that I find can help put us in our students' shoes. So I invite you to share your strongest childhood memory related to food and eating. Uh, it could be something positive, it could be negative, whatever really uh, stuck with you over the years. So, um, hopefully Natalie can start our whiteboard and if you haven't used a whiteboard before there is a um, an options button at the top and then the third option down is annotate so that's um, how you can add text to the whiteboard. Please let us know, or you could also use the chat um, if you'd like to uh, put your comments in that way. And please let us know if you're having uh, problems using the whiteboard. So there's a yeah, view options button. And then if you click that, click on annotate and you should be able to add text. So I see a few people Picking raspberries with my grandma. Celebrations. Forced to finish food on my plate. Making dumplings with my grandma. Lots of um, fond memories of coming together and making food together. Joyful family gatherings. Some birthdays, joyful eating time, times out, family eve, savoring the once a year breaches, eating as a family. A lot of people talking about coming together with loved ones around special times of the year, celebrations. Great. Well, thank you for not wanting to eat my pea soup, which I now love, but didn't then. Okay. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I think these comments really highlight how personal and complex food and eating can really be and how much power there is in connecting and associating foods with positive experiences. So feeling um, feelings of curiosity, wonder, coming together, um, feeling um, feelings of pride or accomplishment and even safety around food. 
On the other hand, we know that when food is connected to feelings of anxiety or stress, or even being pressured or forced to eat a certain food, um, these negative associations can uh, tend to make it harder to learn to enjoy a food in the long run. So next slide. So let's take a closer look at the toolkit, starting with part one, which are the guiding principles for educators. There are three key principles that we felt were most helpful to keep in mind when teaching about food and nutrition. Guiding principle one is taking a positive and inclusive approach to food and eating. This encourages exploring food neutrally through exposures and curiosity, rather than activities that sort food into binary categories, such as healthy or unhealthy. In addition, embracing that eating looks different to everyone and will depend on many factors, including family context, culture and tradition, access and availability, personal taste, allergies, and personal life experiences. The new Candace Food Guide also recognizes that food is more than nutrients. So celebrating all the ways that food brings pleasure and connection and supports our physical, uh, social, and mental wellness. Next slide. Guiding principle two uh, is respecting the roles of adults uh, and children have in eating and feeding. This recognizes that children are not the main decision makers when it comes to food selection and what is being offered. As we know, adults make food decisions that are based on many different factors, including budget and culture. So for this reason, we are trying to shift away from placing responsibility on students for making the quote unquote healthy choice as it can lead to anxiety or confusion for some children. Older students can be supported to build age appropriate skills related to meal planning uh, while continuing to be mindful that our students have different home contexts related to food, uh, food availability and supports. And there are two lessons uh, in the Teach Food First Toolkit for grades six to eight that are uh, provide great examples of how to build meal planning skills in an, an inclusive way. And we'll talk more about those later. Another part of, of this principle, it relates to the eating environment. So being neutral about foods that students are bringing from home and ensuring they have enough time to eat and a pleasant space to eat. Next slide. Guiding principle three is uh, connecting food to students' lived experiences. So engaging uh, students with food and teaching food skills in a practical, experiential way, rather than lessons about healthy choices. So for example, we can teach students how to identify food, foods based on shapes, colors, or textures, uh, exploring uh, how foods are grown or different ways that they can be prepared or eaten. Where possible, supporting learning about your local communities and food systems. This could include learning about a culturally important food, uh, visiting or researching about a local farm, or connecting students to local harvesters and indigenous food knowledge keepers to learn about local foods and practices. And finally, adapting the information provided in this toolkit for your student population. As an educator, you know your students best. So it's certainly not meant to take place of any religious cultural beliefs or practices around food or eating. So part two of the toolkit is what, where you'll find lessons and activities. And I'm sure many of you were, will be keen to dig into this, uh, this, um, this aspect of the toolkit. Uh, in addition to rec the rec recommended lessons from other organizations, 10 lessons were specifically developed for the Teach Food First Toolkit, and three of those are about traditional First Nation food lessons. On the website, you can search for lessons based on grade level or the different themes that relate to Canada's food guide. So for example, um, here I've pulled up everything that relates to healthy eating. Next slide. Part three is uh, frequently asked questions and resources. So here you'll find some resources or responses uh, to common questions we get asked by educators about the Candace Food Guide, as well as an array of additional resources if you're looking to learn more about a specific topic. Now let's look at the revised BC Physical and Health Education Curriculum elaborations. 
I wanted to emphasize that the curriculum, curricular competencies themselves have not changed. The plan is to revise those uh, in the future, but for now it's only the elaborations that have been updated. So if you've already planned your uh, health units, uh, no worries, feel free to use this for your future planning. So the updates um, to the elaborations were made to help bring uh, the PHE elaborations in alignment with the current Candace Food Guide, which came out in 2019, um, and, and to bring it in alignment with current best practices and pedagogy for food and nutrition education for children, um, as well as uh, the approaches and lessons in Teach Food First. Next slide. So let's take a, a closer look. For the next slide, I'll be showing some elaboration updates as well as how they connect to uh, some Teach Food First lessons. So here you are seeing some of the updates for the elaborations for kindergarten, grade one and grade two. Um, so there is a shift from focusing on healthy choices and the health benefits of food to exploring food much more broadly. So for example, in terms of shape or color, texture, how food connects to family history, culture, need nature, our communities, etc. Next slide. So in terms of lessons, the people I like to eat with lesson for kindergarten to grade two links to several of these elaborations. This lesson encourages students to reflect on who they enjoy eating with, as well as drawing a picture of a meal or snack they'd like to eat with others. Next slide. The next lesson, Exploring Our Drinks for K-2, to uh, not surprisingly links to the water elaboration. So water refreshes us and helps us grow and learn. In this lesson, students explore where water comes from and uh, its different roles in daily life. Next slide. So moving on to some of the changes to elaborations for grades uh, three, four, and five. So under grade five, you'll see that Canada's food guide no longer uses rec uh, recommend, recommended daily servings. So that has been changed to enjoying a variety of foods. And for grade uh, five, the elaborations focus on food choices to support health. So that list of, of um, choices has been expanded to include uh, culture, tradition, and enjoyment of food. Next slide. So in terms of lessons, the where food comes from lesson for grades three to five includes learning opportunities to li that links to many of these elaborations. Uh, it includes an activity where st students draw food on a landscape to identify where it came from, as well as thinking about how these foods can be prepared and enjoyed. Next slide. Uh, the content elaboration for grade three about hydration uh, links to the roles of water in our lives lesson for grades three to five. And in addition to this, I also wanted to highlight that almost all of the lessons are cross-curricular. So they connect to other subject area competencies uh, in science, uh, for example, in, or English language arts. Uh, so for, for instance, one of the activities in this particular lesson asked students to write a story uh, about a day without water. So these are, sorry, next slide. These are the examples of elaboration updates for grades six, seven, and eight. They focus on influences on food choices, and they have been expanded to include influences such as family traditions, personal taste and texture, culture and celebrations, as well as media and peers. For grade eight, it builds on top of that further to also look at advertising, social media, and the impacts of colonization. And there's also an elaboration for grade eight uh, about learning to uh, that learning to plan and make our food is a lifelong skill. Next slide. So I wanted to highlight these two lessons. Um, the recipe exploration and creating a special uh, event menu are two lessons from Teach Food First uh, that connect with um, all of these elaborations for grades six to eight. The recipe exploration lesson gives students the opportunity to pick a food from Canada's food guide to explore and to create a recipe with, and then they come up with a marketing campaign to promote that recipe to their peers. 
the next lesson, students plan a special meal event and everything that goes along with that. So the menu, the budget, a grocery list, decorations, and even the activities that they want to do. Next slide. Uh, Water in the Media is uh, for grades six to eight is another lesson that support, supports students to critically think about influences on marketing and media messages, as well as uh, issues related to access to safe water in remote and Indigenous communities. Next slide. So this slide highlights the three traditional food First Nation lessons that were uh, created a bit differently. They're created as a suite of lesson plans that can be adapted across the grade levels that explore Indigenous foods, as well as the impact uh, of colonization on Indigenous foods and food systems. Um, and they do this through uh, local storytelling and engaging activities. We do ask that teachers use your discretion for the third lesson, the gifts of the season, or sorry, the uh, the gifts of the people lesson, which does include more advanced topics such as colonization that may not be suitable for grades uh, K to two. So all of these lesson plans tie back to the physical and health education elaborations across the grades, as well as being cross-curricular and are based on the first people's principles of learning. Next slide. So the traditional First Nation foods lesson plans were developed by five Indigenous knowledge keepers, many of whom are from or live on the homelands of the Coast Salish, the Nutanu, and the Kwakwa Kwewak families, also known as Vancouver Island. Um, so based on feedback, they also created a foundational knowledge document to complement these lessons, and it provides teachers with background information and various resources to support teaching this topic. So how do you access the toolkit? The easiest way is to go to teachfoodfirst.ca. Officially, the toolkit will live on the Healthy Schools BC website and it's also uploaded to ShareEd BC. We are looking to conduct an evaluation in the spring and we're currently uh, collecting contact information for any teachers who are interested in providing feedback. So if you'd like to do that, you can go sign up for the evaluation by submitting your name and email address to the join art evaluation box, which is a big red box on the website. Um, and another option is to fill out the feedback form and that will be uh, sent, to, uh, sent to us directly. So we want to make sure these resources are meeting your needs. So we're very keen on hearing all your thoughts, experiences, and suggestions for improvement. So that brings us to the end of the uh, webinar um, presentation. And I believe Natalie has a few more poll questions um, before we jump into questions. Thanks, Amelia. Yeah, just if you could indulge us a couple more times, I'm going to launch another poll here around using Teach Food First in the future. So after today, do you plan on using Teach Food First? Great, thanks for answering. Uh, so it looks like we have quite a few folks that uh, are going to try it out. Um, some that are already using it. Uh, someone, oops, they're still on this webinar. <laughs> um, and then I'm not sure I still have questions. So that's a perfect segue. Um, I have, do have one more poll, but uh, if you can use that Q&A function right now, if you've got any questions that you wanna put in there, uh, we have a bit of time here that we can answer some questions. So the next uh, and last poll question is, we're curious how you heard about this webinar opportunity or Teach Food First in general.
Okay, so we've got quite a variety here. Certainly some folks have, have heard through the uh, Deputy Minister's bulletin from the Ministry of Education. Uh, some from DASH, Healthy Schools BC, who does host the Teach Food First website. Um, gotta love our colleagues as public health dietitians spreading the word. Uh, other school community partners, uh, BCTF and the Provincial Specialist Associations. And I love 30%, someone cool told me about this. I haven't seen, oh, uh, maybe I'm seeing some uh, questions come in. I know I had uh, one question come in um, around plans to work on the grade nine to 12 curriculum to support high school teachers and students. Thanks for the question. It's certainly uh, something that has been on our radar is we have focused on K to eight for this particular opportunity, um, but we are keen to look at what the opportunities look like in the nine to 12. Um, so I don't have any firm yes or no on that, but it is definitely on our radar and something that uh, we'll be looking towards uh, incorporating into our work. And the same question was in the Q and A. Um, if folks would rather vocalize their question, please feel free to put your hand up. Um, that way I can unmute you and you can also ask your question out loud if you prefer to do it that way. Also a question around confirming that the toolkit is not a hard copy document. Uh, rather, it's the website with lots of information as well as resources such as the lesson plans shown. So yes, thank you. Deanna, another member of the working group, uh, good um, flag there that it isn't a hard copy, that we are uh, totally virtual. It is a website uh, with lots of different resources available to you. Natalie, I think there's a question about someone asking why the serving sizes were eliminated. It's in the, it's in the chat. Oh, okay. Did you want me to? Why don't you answer? try that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I think there was a recognition from Canada's food guide that you, the serving sizes were uh, very uh, confusing to use. Um, and also that nutritional needs are very individualized and can even change for a person from day to day. Um, so really the, the the Canada's Food Guide has shifted to promoting mindful eating and sort of tuning in and listening to your cues of hunger and fullness to guide how much uh, to eat. Um, and that also fits really nicely with uh, the division of responsibility, which is the best practice approach to feeding children, where um, there's a division in roles and adults are responsible for providing the foods at, in regular uh, meals and snacks. And it's up to the child to decide how much or whether to eat within that structure. So um, I think that's much more in alignment with, with the division of responsibility as well, that we shouldn't be teaching um, uh, prescriptive serving sizes uh, to children. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> we also have another question here. Maybe uh, I'll ask Amelia if she wants to take a stab at it. So we've had to address food sharing with students because of the new restrictions. Does the guide, guide work around this? Could you elaborate? Like, I guess, are you talking about COVID restrictions? That's what I assume um, it's likely. Around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is a um, actually a resource that was uh, co-developed by uh, dietitians and community partners. I think it's called Food Based Learning. Um, the supports some ideas around COVID friendly food exploration. Um, so we can certainly send that to you or send it to the group if that's something you're concerned about. Um, I think the concern more is not, you know, sitting together and sharing a meal or a snack, but more so when children are taking bites of each other's um, food and, and we don't, you know, we wanna discourage that to uh, prevent transmission of, of, COVID, of the virus. Uh, we do have another question here about do you offer any zoom meetings with students via class workshops i can tackle this one if you want or you can go for it oh go ahead so so this particular opportunity is is really to um, reach educators and other um, community, school community partners um, we won't be offering something specific for um, students um, it's not to say that some of our ngo partners um, don't offer a similar type of service um, for example, farm to school, 
um, BCI in the classroom. I'm not sure, Amelia, if you have a few more examples to share. Yeah, there may be some dietitians that work in community may offer uh, to come in and to facilitate workshops, but this toolkit is really recognizing that as educators, you are the experts in, in um, sort of teaching and being able to engage your students. And so hopefully it provides you with some tools um, um, that helps you feel more comfortable with exploring food in the classroom in a number of different ways. I see Nicole, uh, one of our colleagues has put up her hand. Nicole, I did unmute you or give you the ability to unmute yourself. Sorry, I didn't, that was an accident. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the food resources, sorry, my apologies. No problem. Um, and then Carla was another one that had her hand up. I'm not sure if that was from earlier, Carla, or if, we, if you had a question you wanted to uh, pose. It could have been from earlier. So we might just give it a minute or two if there's anybody else that wants to put up their hand or wants to use the Q&A uh, function to submit any questions. Uh, so do you know when the recorded webinar will be available on the website? Um, hopefully within the next week or two. Uh, I just have to figure out the logistics of, of getting it up on a website. So uh, shortly, I would say the answer to that question. Okay, so we've got, sorry, I have to toggle between the Q&A and the chat to make sure I don't miss anybody. And so maybe Amelia, I might ask you if you wanna tackle this question. So um, what would you say to students who eat dried noodles daily for recess snacks and lunch? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, the influences, um, the factors that influence influence what children bring to school are many. Um, so it may be that that's what's available. Um, it may be that's the only foods that they, they accept right now. Um, and it's usually the parent or caregiver that is uh, making those choices and offering food uh, to students. So um, our philosophy would be not to comment on foods that children uh, bring from home and instead uh, focus your efforts on um, applying or exploring food in the classroom and getting them more familiar with a variety of foods that come from Canada's food guide. Um, students are more likely to uh, eat foods that they are familiar with, that they um, see other people eating. Um, and so being a, a, a role model um, yourself in terms of what you bring uh, to the classroom and, and how you talk around uh, talk about food um, is, is also an important aspect of that. So yeah, we would say, you know, um, avoid commenting on any foods that students bring into the classroom um, and just focus on the food exploration. Thanks, Amelia. Someone's asking about uh, any grants besides the BC Dairy uh, Vini grant. Um, I'm not aware of any grants. I'm not sure if it's specific to teaching about food and nutrition, but um, I might invite any of my colleagues um, that are on the line or Amelia if, if they know of any other grants that might be available. Aside from farm to school, I know they have some grants. Could the person maybe who asked the question clarify, um, like, are you looking for grants to bring food into the classroom or because farm to school BC does uh, provide grants, um, farm to cafeteria, if you're interested in a salad bar program, um, there's also some local grants and I can't speak to other uh, regions, but in Northern Health, we have the Imagine Grant, um, so that could potentially be used for um, supporting learning opportunities around food. Mm -hmm. That was the question, and it sounds like they're aware of those opportunities as well. Okay. Yeah.
Well, I don't see any more questions coming in, uh, so maybe we will. Oh, just a comment. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> Uh, perhaps we can wrap things up. I know folks, um, it's near the end of the day. Thank you so much for joining today's session on Teach Food First. Um, our contact information is on that last slide, or you can always reach us through the Teach Food First website if you do have any further questions that you wanna follow up on. And as I mentioned, we will post this webinar to the Teach Food uh, First website. So if you have colleagues that missed today's webinar, uh, there will be a recording that they can access at a later time. So with that, I think we will uh, stop today's webinar and uh, wish you all well. And thanks, Amelia, for a fantastic job on presenting on Teach Food First. Thanks, everyone.